thank you for the um, invitation to talk today. So what I'm really going to do is, because I'm the first um, sort of climate modeler to speak, then I'm going to give quite an introductory talk and, and actually talk a bit about, um, give an introduction to climate models. So how do they work? What's the physical basis behind climate models? And I'll actually give a bit of a historical perspective as well, because I think that's interesting to sort of put current models into some context, is to know sort of how they've improved or changed in the past, and then, you know, therefore you can perhaps um, have some understanding of perhaps how they might improve in the future as well. So then I'll talk about the evaluation of climate models. So how good are they? Uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses? And then I'll move on to climate sensitivity, talk about, well, people have already covered this already, so we're talking about the definitions, but in particular what I'm going to focus on is thinking about the timescales involved, and in particular very long timescales, and do we need to take those into account? At what point in the future do we need to take those into account? And what are these very long-term feedbacks that have, uh, may play some role in determining climate sensitivity? Uh, and then I'll talk uh, at the very end about, talk about um, transient change and what I think is the importance of, um, it's a point that Kevin made earlier, the importance of considering not just climate sensitivity, but also regional geographic change in temperature and also other variables and extreme events, et cetera, et cetera. So just to kick things off, an, intro an introduction to climate models. Now, actually, in, in sort of conceptual terms, climate models are really quite, um, quite simple in some ways. And in the, the core of every general circulation model, or GCM, is actually a set of primitive equations that you can actually write down on, a, on one page. Um, and actually solving them is much, more, is much more complex. Obviously, they incorporate sort of the fluid dynamic, the fundamental fluid dynamics, uh, Newton's equations of motion, the first law of th thermodynamics, conservation of mass and moisture, the ideal gas law. These are all things that we've known for, for centuries, actually, the underlying physics that is um, in a climate model. Actually, solving the set of equations on a, uh, a rotating sphere is actually uh, is more complex and where you have to take into account things like what's going on at the poles and things like that. It gets... It makes it more complex, but really the fundamental science of this part, this core of climate models, is actually very well known. Um, the way that we tend to, um, or most models are formulated to set up and solve this set of equations is um, illustrated sort of conceptually here. We tend to divide the world up into a series of grid boxes, a sort of matrix, a three-dimensional matrix of uh, boxes that go up in the atmosphere and down in the ocean, and actually, well, the way the models work, you formulate this, this set of equations in this uh, matrix of grid boxes. And the models can't, what it means is the models can't tell you anything at a spatial scale that is smaller than one of these grid boxes. So, um, you know, if you're in this example, this is quite an old slide now, so this resolution is relatively low, but and it's a very uh, UK centric slide. But, you know, it can tell you something about sort of averages on the scale of uh, the UK, but if you wanted to know the, um, the climate in the future in New Haven, for example, it would. Uh, because um, that's much smaller than the spatial scale of one of these boxes, you, a typical climate model can just not give you um, that level of information. So you, have this, so you have this core, this fluid dynamical component, if you like, but then there's a lot of other processes that are going on that we also take, have to take into account of. For example, the absorption of scattering of radiation in the atmosphere, um, and in particular, um, subgrid scale processes. So these are any physical process that is occurring on a spatial scale that's smaller um, the one of these grid boxes. Actually, we can't simulate that using fundamental equations. We have to do some approximation for that process. That, and that approximations, they can come from um, observations. So we observe the large-scale properties of convection and clouds, et cetera, and uh, represent that in our, in our climate model. Or we can use the same fundamental equations that we think work on a very small parcel of air, apply those to a, a you know, scale that up to a larger scale, and perhaps end up with some what we call um, tunable parameters in our model that represent these, these um, we don't know what the number is of, the, of this particular tunable parameters, but they're sort of a scaling factor, if you like, for some of these processes. Um, and so there are, there, there are these so-called parameterizations of these subscale pro sub grid scale processes that exist in both um, the atmosphere and the ocean in, in climate models. So this is the sort of the framework that, that we have. In particular, one of the largest uncertainties associated with the clouds, the fact that um, the, the typical grid box size of a climate model is actually much larger than the spatial scale on which uh, clouds are forming and developing means that actually this is one of the most uncertain parts of climate models and means that and it's actually a result of the why a, a model that's developed in 
uh, the US compared to the UK, compared to different institutions across the world end up giving um, different results, tend to be not because of differences in this part, in the fundamental physics, but in the way these subgrid scale processes are represented. So that's a sort of in introduction to climate models. I thought I'd give a brief potted history of actually how they developed. The, the first ever climate model uh, developed was this, by this guy, L.F. Richardson, who formulated his grid boxes um, actually just over um, northwest Europe, and he carried out the first ever numerical weather forecast in 1917. Now, this was actually before the advent of computers, so he did this by hand, um, by writing out the equations, solving them by hand with a, using a slide rule, etc., etc. Um, and he actually, um, what he found was he wrote down the fundamental equations, solved them. But actually, unfortunately, what he found was that all the mass in his model sort of piled up in one or two grid boxes, and all the mass in other grid boxes in other regions that you know you ended up with almost no atmosphere in some of these boxes. It turned out he hadn't, it wasn't because he'd made a mistake in his calculations, but actually he hadn't properly accounted for um, the boundaries in the model and also some of these sub-grid scale processes. Basically he hadn't put enough diffusion in his model um, to sort of account for some of the, to, that would have counteracted some of these problems he had. But anyway, that was the first sort of numerical weather forecast that we had in 1917. The first one that actually carried on a computer was by uh, Jewel Charney, and this was using, this is a, a picture of his computer, the ENIAC, that in 1950 actually it solved a very similar set of equations to those that um, L.F. Richardson used. I mean, he did the first realistic 24-hour weather forecast on this, on this machine. Unfortunately for him, it actually took, tw it took 24 hours to run, so <laughs> in terms of weather forecasting, it wasn't particularly useful. Um, but it was, you know, it was, you know it was, that's how science progresses. <laughs> so uh, nowadays, Supercomputers actually look very similar to, to how they were in those days, but obviously they're because of miniaturization, everything's you know much more powerful. It's a, so just going back to this, uh, if you your typical um, iPhone or um, you know the chip in the mobile phone in your pocket is about almost a hundred thousand times more powerful um, than this machine here, um, and this is actually a few hundred thousand times more powerful than your uh, iPhone. So that's the sort of uh, progression that we've had, and now. So that's the progression in terms of um, the computation. Actually, the, what goes into the models also um, improved and increased. So in terms of the mid-70s, you had a, a model that maybe represented processes. It had, they, they've always had this dynamical coring, but in terms of the physics and sub-grid scale processes represented in the model in the 70s, you had a very simple representation, maybe including clouds and, and precipitation in the 70s and 80s. As we move forward in time, we get more and more processes actually included in the models. And this is an image from the last um, IPCC report showing um, sort of the size of these funny cylinders. I think it's supposed to represent the complexity of the different processes that have gone in the models from the 70s up to AR5, the most recent IPCC assessment report here. And this, you know, one of the comments previously was that why has that range of climate sensitivity actually stayed the same? Why isn't that, as we go forward in time, why aren't our uncertainties in climate sensitivity shrinking and actually this is one of the reasons is because over time we're including more and more processes and so because of that the un your uncertainty is basically growing with time although your understanding of some of the more fundamental physics and um, processes if, if you had a, if we had a model now that had the same number of processes that um, the early models of Charney had for example then I think there would be much more convergence than what he had um, but now we improve we include a lot more um, a lot more processes. So as well as the amount of physics and chemistry and biology that's being included, also the spatial scale of these grid boxes is also increasing with time. So in the 90s, you had a tip. This is actually, you might not be able to recognize it. This is actually uh, Europe here. Um, but as we go down into the current generation of models, you get a, a flavor for the resolution. So this is just a, a region within a whole global model. And then looking to the, to the future, the IPCC anticipates that by the next IPCC assessment report, we might be looking at a resolution of perhaps tens of kilometers, each one of these um, grid boxes. So along, along with this, along with this increase in complexity and resolution, actually the amount, the vol just the volume of code increased. This was a figure that I found quite interesting. It says actually the number of lines of code in a typical climate model. Um, and actually we're up, a typical model now, this is the UK um, Hadley Center model, is about a million lines of code. So clearly there is no one at any sort of climate institution who actually understands every aspect of 
of their climate model. These are models that are developed by you know, different groups concentrating on different um, parts of the model and developing something that's actually huge. To put that number in context, a million lines of code, I did a bit of Googling and found that actually a typical computer game is actually also about a million lines of code. So I, I don't know, that seemed quite a bit depressing to me. But <laughs> um, so, so moving on, so, I'll, so think about how good, are the, how good are these climate models? You know, what, how good are they at representing different processes and different variables? And, and so, just, so this is from the last IPCC report. This is quite an old generation model now, the UK one, HADCM3. And this shows the distribution of model predicted temperature um, for the current climate, effectively, um, in degrees C. And here you have a, a map of observations, so what we think the real answer is. Now, there's, someone, there's uncertainty associated with the observations, in particular in regions like Antarctica, where we have very few observations. So this is, just, this is hiding a bit of uncertainty, actually, in the observations themselves. If you look at this, it, at first glance, it looks, pretty, it looks pretty good, but actually it's quite misleading because you could almost get, you could get something that looked very like this just by saying the poles are warmer, the, the poles are cooler than... Um, the equatorial regions, and we put in some sort of um, cooling as we go to, to higher regions. And what, so what we're really interested in is sort of the anomaly. And again, this is the previous IPCC report showing the error, if you like, in, in all the climate models that took part in that last I IPCC report, where it's bright red, the models are too warm by about 5 degrees C, C and where they're blue, um, they're too cool by about 5 degrees C. And, the, and you know, you, you see that these, the models are very different. They have errors in different different regions. There are some, re some areas that appear particularly um, problematic. There are perhaps a cold bias in a lot of the models in, in northern Eurasia. Um, and also, another thing to point out is that there's, you know, there isn't a single model out there that doesn't have an error somewhere of at least 5 degrees C um, in one, somewhere in the, in the globe. Um, another sort of point of interest, this is the previous generation, like I said, of the UK model. It actually ended up in the last IPC report of being one of the the better models, and the, the Met Office invested a huge amount of money in improving a lot of the, the physics and, and the resolution of the model. But actually, because when a model is first developed, you need to, like I said, it's got a lot of these internal um, parameterizations, and actually knowing what value they should have is actually quite uncertain. And so that the process of trying to get your model as the best fit as possible to the observations, a tuning process is undertaken. And as a new model is being developed, that's actually quite difficult because the model is very slow to run. And so, for, for example, the uh, more recent models don't always do better. This is a, the, a more recent model than this one. Don't, you don't always get an improvement in the actual climatology, although actually some of the underlying physics and, and thermodynamics might be being better represent, represented. Um, this shows a, a figure of, of the error actually in the average in the average model. So if you mean all the climate models together and compare that with observations. And actually, this does better than any one single model. So the average, the average model is um, better than any one individual model. As well as, to, just to highlight a point I'm going to make a bit later, as well as looking at temperature, we are, the IPCC and the CMIP, which is the Coupled Model into Comparison Project, puts a huge amount of effort into evaluating these models, not just compared to temperature, but compared to a huge range of observations, for example, precipitation, sea ice, um, and this, was a, this is a very colourful figure from the current IPC report where, so you've got all the different models along here, and uh, you've got a number of different variables, a number of different observational data sets that have been used to evaluate these climate models. Um, on this axis, it doesn't really matter uh, what they are for the point I'm making, but what the colours show is where, it's, where you have a blue colour, um, that particular model is better um, compared to observations than a sort of the median climate model. Um, where it's red, it's actually worse than the median climate model. And so you can see there are some models, for example, um, let me, I'll, I'll pick on the CESM as uh, Kevin's here, where's that? Here. So actually, this is one of, the, one of the best models in that it performs better than the median model. It's blue um, for a lot of these variables. Um, but actually, the multi-model mean, which is the one on the far left, the average of the model, all the models is actually, for the majority of variables, is actually better than any um, single individual model. So actually, there's sort of a wisdom of crowds effect going on, if you like, in that the, the average model is better than any individual one. So as well as, comp as, well as evaluating the model compared with a snapshot of um, current climate, we can also look at time series. And obviously, this is very important when, if we're interested in the transient evolution of climate going into the future. And, and here we've got a, a spaghetti plot of 
um, temperature anomalies, so zero is sort of an average of um, the late 1800s or something, and we've got 1.5 degrees um, above that in the, global, in the global average mean up here. Um, along here we go from the 1890s up to the present day, and the black solid line that you can almost see in here is an observation, so, some, so an observational um, uh, representation from observations of um, current, the evolution over the last 100 years, and the individual lines are basically every model that took part, every GCM that took part in um, the IPCC report. And you can see that it captures, the models capture a lot of the variability Actually, so some of this is associated with volcanic events that have gone off, which are these uh, marked here, where we get quite a, a, a rapid but relatively short-lived cooling. Um, but the gradual increase and in the warming of the last, in particular, of, well, of the last 150 years, but in particular of the um, last 50, 60 years or so, is actually very well represented. Um, perhaps less well re represented at the very end, but I think that's something that um, Kevin's going to talk about a bit later. But basically, we have from this, we can gain some sort of, it's a good way of evaluating the models. We can go back over longer time scales. So now we're looking at, a, so this is where the observations become much more uncertain. But now we're looking at 1,000 years of temperature evolution. Now, um, these are, the data now is in the, are these gray sort of shaded area, and the models are the, the colored lines. But again, even on this time scale of 1,000 years, so by observations, what I'm talking about now is data, of, a lot of data from tree ring analysis, for example. So some sort of proxy if you like, estimate of temperature. But again, some of the, the features of the long-term cooling um, of the last, of the, early of the earlier part of the millennia, and then the warming in the last 100 years or so is very well captured by the models, the relative magnitude of that compared to the observations. We can also go even further back in time. This is something a couple of people have mentioned about going back into deeper time and telling us something about bigger magnitude changes. And here we've got on the right, we've got um, land surface temperature change, and on the left, we've got sea surface temperature change for a future projection, projection prediction at the top for end of the century. And down here, we've got three different past time periods. So here we've got the last ice age. In the background is a model prediction, or an average of lots of different models. And then the colored dots um, represent, again, proxy observation, sort of indirect proxy observational from the geological record of what the temperature change actually was. And so. We've got the last ice age here, 21,000 years ago. We've got the so-called Pliocene, 3 million years ago. And down here, we've got the Eocene going back 50 million years. And what you can see here is the temperature change from the proxies is, is actually vastly outstrips that predicted for um, 100 years in the future. And that's because CO2 levels during this time were thought to be so high. Um, but because of natural variations and the timescale of those changes in CO2 are actually much, much slower um, than what the... Um, Experiencing now, but the key take-home message here is actually in terms of the magnitude of the observed in dots compared to the model predicted um, in the background is actually there's quite good agreement there in terms of actually the magnitude of temperature and change. CO2 that's causing those different changes, or something else? So that's a very good question. So in this case, in terms of the last ice, well, so in terms of this one, ultimately this is this is actually ultimately driven by changes in Earth's orbit. In fact, so this is as um, the so-called eccentricity of the orbit, how elliptical it is, and the actual tilt of the rotation of the Earth changes. But, but that, ult that forcing that actually leads to changes in carbon dioxide concentration. So, and that in turn or also associated with the orbital forcing, we have changes in ice sheets. So actually, there's, a, there's the ultimate forcing is orbit. Then we have a, there's a CO2 component here and a fact that we've got massive ice sheets over North America so and Europe. Yes, yeah, so in this case, those, those ice sheets here are not predicted by the model, so we yeah. don't have a... And is the CO2 predicted, or is that prescribed? CO2 is predicted, it's, sorry, it's prescribed here, but we know the number extremely well from ice core records. So going back here 20,000 years ago, we know what that number should be to within a few ppm. But that doesn't give us any indication that the model, if you did something like that, would actually predict changes in CO2 or... Yeah, so none of these models are actually testing the carbon cycle response of the model. So none of them are saying, well, if you had a, you know, some external forcing, how much would CO2 change? All they're saying is that if you put a CO2 change into the model, then does it, and keep that fixed and ignore any sort of biogeochemical feedbacks, then what's the temperature response? Our models do that. Yes, but in general, they, you have to run that sort of model for much, much longer to get it into equilibrium, and so... Typically, that sort of study is done by models of much lower resolution and much lower complexity, but that include a lot of biogeochemical feedbacks as well. 
Um, and actually, the CO2 is prescribed in these, is in these two cases. The main driver, we think, is actually CO2. And that is, a, again, a number that is put, into, is put into the model, not predicted. And Mark, is, Mark Pagani is one of the world experts in actually trying to reconstruct what the CO2 level actually was at this time that we then put in the model. So anyway, I probably better um, speed up a bit. So climate sensitivity, we've had definitions about this, but what I'm really going to think about is what is, do we mean by at equilibrium? So how do you actually estimate climate sensitivity in the model? What you do is you have a sort of a background climate simulation, which is bobbling along here. Um, and it's, it's interesting to note there is a lot of intranual variability here. It's not a smooth, in, you know, in reality, when we don't, in the, the models as well as um, the real world, there's intranual variability there. So you can have a period of several years where actually you might get um, a co um, cooling in climate followed by warming. So there's some sort of stochastic, stochastic uh, variability in there. And then suddenly you increase um, CO2 to calculate climate sensitivity traditionally by a factor of two. Um, actually, this is a, a different experiment where we multiply it by four. But anyway, and then temperature increases very rapidly, so rapidly that you can't even see it at the beginning um, of this simulation on this time scale of years. Um, and then it gradually, you would hope, would ultimately reach an equilibrium. This is an example where actually it's very hard to see that this is, um, you know, the, the, that this is when this, what would be the, actually equi the equilibrium, the true equilibrium um, climate response here. But because it's because these models are so expensive to run, to actually get them to full equilibrium can actually take, you know, actually literally months and months, if not years, of model simulation time. So actually, it's very rarely done that we, that we actually reach an ultimate equilibrium. Um, so I'll, I'll, speed, I'll speed over this, because this is talking about how um, some of these results of climate sensitivity. But again, to come back to this thing of what do we really mean about equilibrium? What do we need to include to get a true equilibrium? We actually need to include everything in the Earth system, every single process. Now, there is no model out there, no model out there that actually includes all these processes. And typically, you know, some of the important ones that we think could play a really important role on the time scale of, uh, particularly when we come to uh, millennia, is actually um, ice sheets. So there are, there are models out there that's beginning to include um, the fact that as climate warms, you get a change in the geometry of the ice sheet. They will start to melt, you get changes in the albedo reflectivity and, and feedbacks associated with that. Um, but even when they are included, actually, they don't tend to be run out to equilibrium long enough to actually realize what the full, true equilibrium climate sensitivity is. So ice sheet processes, very important, associated with changes associated with the reflectivity, associated ocean circulation as we dump all this fresh water um, into the ocean. Also, vegetation process, change in vegetation are much more beginning to be included um, in models, but again, to actually run them out to full equilibrium, the time scales associated with vegetation um, are not very well known. But when you, one thing you can do is get a handle on some of these processes by looking at the past and looking at the observational record and how ice sheets and vegetation have uh, varied in the past from the, and include those, prescribe those changes in ice sheets and vegetation in your model. And if you do that, it turns out different people have done this, but it actually can do as much as double your estimate of climate sensitivity if you include some of these long time scale processes. Now, what's really um, disconcerting in some ways is actually some of these processes, we understand them so, our understanding of them is so poor that actually we don't know what the time scales are that are associated with them. So if you think about the ice sheets, for example, we know that that can cause a large amplifying effect on climate sensitivity, but there are many processes, for example, as um, ice sheets start to melt, they build up um, a lot of water on the surface, and this can fall down so-called uh, crevices in the ice, and this can lubricate the bedrock of the ice and actually accelerate um, the melting of an ice sheet. And actually, the importance of that process is something that we don't know at the moment. So when you ask us about what are the timescales or what are the likelihood of some of these um, effects and amplifiers of climate sensitivity, actually, we don't know the answer at the moment because there's still a lot of the physics of the system that we're still trying to get to grips with. And because they potentially occur on a long time scale, we don't have a good observational record to actually constrain them. So I'll leave it at that. Apologies for overrunning a bit.